And so now with that in mind, I'd like to transition to the <clears throat> topic I wanted to discuss with you today. As you've heard last Sunday, we have started a uh, kind of a new mini-series about what church is and, and what, why we believe what we believe and, and what our expectations are and, and, and what, why Good News Church and what it's all about. And so <clears throat> we're kind of starting with some basics. Um, if you have been a mature believer for an extended period of time, some of what I'm going to be talking about today may seem elementary, but one of the reasons for that is because we're going to be using parts of this recording as a um, kind of a, a video uh, new members class. We want to put together a, 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 a video package, if you will, where you'll be able to complete your membership class online. And uh, we're going to take some of these recordings from these sermons and, and incorporate them into the class. And so that's part of the reason we're going through it as well. But it's a great reminder for all of us. And uh, if you're new or relatively new or if you haven't heard this before, I pray that it will be a blessing to you and it will impact you um, in your heart. And the Holy Spirit will, will lead you to, to be different, to be more like Jesus. Amen? All right. All right. So, today's message is, what is church? What is church? Now, if I was to ask you, what is church, what would you say? Go ahead and yell it out. Got to be louder. I'm a little bit on the deaf side. So, what would you say? People. people. People, very good. You must have been at the first service. What else? People. People. <laughs> he... Probably wasn't the first service, or he just heard the previous answer. I don't know. What else? <laughs> Worship. What else? Well, it's a church. More people. More people. Yes, a big church, right? <clears throat> but people is the right answer. But let, let's be honest. How, how often have you either heard or said, I go to church in Tacoma, or... I go to church on South Puget Sound Avenue, or I attend this church uh, that's located over there, or where this pastor is. And, and we refer to a church many times, and I'm guilty of that as well. We refer to a church as a place. We refer to a church, oh, have you seen this church on the, you know, on the right side of the road? We just drove by it. We refer to a church as a building, as a place. And yes, it's a place, it's here, but the church is much more than that. It's not just a building, it's not a place, it's not limited by these materials or, you know, we, we used to meet at a different location and we were a church, right? And the building maybe looks like a traditional church. It has a cross on top so or somewhere on the property and, and it's, it looks like a church. You can tell it's a church. And then you have a church that meets in a gym uh, at a local high school. And that's a church. They continue being a church. And so we know that it's the people inside, like you have said correctly, it's the people that make a church a church, not the building. In fact, in many countries, people meet at people's houses. They're not able to kind of kind of have a building or own a building legally or there's persecution from the government or they come from many different villages and gather together. And so the bottom line is they meet at each other's houses. It's just small, small places. But it's also a church. The early church did that, by the way. They've met at people's houses. So the buildings are not the church. People in that building are the church. So the question then is, why do these people get together? Why are you here? What's the purpose that you've gathered here today? And why are there people all over the world getting together and, and getting together on, on Sunday morning, different days of the week? Why? Now, if if I was to ask you why people come to church and if they were honest with themselves and they did a little bit of analysis, they would, they would find some interesting things. Some people think, <clears throat> excuse me, that the church is a place where you can go and meet nice people. Where you can go and meet nice people. People, you know, don't have major addictions. They, they try to do the right thing. They try 
to, to be good. They try to serve the community. That's a place, you know, maybe you're looking to get married. Maybe you're looking for a spouse and, hey, well, let's, I, I'll go to church. I'll, I'll find a spouse there because we, we know they're trying to live, live the right way. Some people attend because they're lonely, especially during this COVID craziness. You know, when people are locked down, they want to get out of the house and, hey, let's go do something. Let's go do this activity or, or, or they, they want to be part of something else. And, you know, youth and teens are, are, are a big example of that. They're all about friends. They're all about wanting to connect, right? And ask them what the sermon was about. They'll tell you, you know, maybe the introduction, maybe a couple of sentences. They come because they have a social need. Their friends are there. They want to hang out. Some others attend because they have problems in life. And they want their lives to get better. They want a problem in their life to be fixed. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's business, sometimes it's money issues, sometimes it's addictions, whatever it is. They have a problem in their life and they have tried to fix it on their own. They can't fix it and so they come <clears throat> to church and that's a good thing but it, it's not all there is to being a church. Some attend because their spouse dragged them in here. You know, their wife made them come. And you know what? As long as Super Bowl is not on, as long as there is no good game um, on TV, whether it's soccer or football or whatever sports you watch, as long as there is no better entertainment out there, I'll go with my spouse and make him or her happy and just, just attend church. Nothing wrong with it. I'll tag along. Most of these are reasonable reasons. But they're not good enough reasons to gather together. Some believers, those who are followers of Jesus, who've been born again, there is a, this, this popular view that's partially correct, but not completely correct, that you are here to worship God and get spiritual food. That you are here to just to come to to worship God, great worship music, great experience, you come in and you, get, you hear something spiritual from the pastor, and maybe it'll tug at your heart a little bit, maybe it'll encourage you, maybe it'll convict you, but you come and then after that you leave and then you go home. Friends, that's not all there is, because if that's the only motivation when you come to church, uh, to a church service, <clears throat> then basically it's like going to a movie theater. It's like going to a movie theater. And I'll explain how. Give me a sec. I've been singing too hard, I think. So what's, what's been happening? Got to watch that. It's like a movie theater, but with a spiritual focus. You come. There is a show prepared for you. And there is, there is something entertaining, great music, there is a big screen, there is a pastor that will talk to you, and then before, after the service, you can get some coffee, hang out with some friends, maybe play some games, we've got a couple ping pong tables out there, by the way, it's just great time, and then, and then you leave, and you know what, it's just like going to a theater but with a spiritual focus. I'm there to consume. I'm there to be entertained. I'm there to be made feel good. And friends, the problem with that is that all of the focus is on you. You're the center of that. You are basically a religious consumer. And the church is the producer of whatever you need. You know what, my kids are kept taken care of, they're learning something, they're hanging out. All of my needs are met. The problem with that is that if the church all of a sudden doesn't provide the most interesting show, or the free babysitting, or the free coffee, or the whatever that you were looking for, as a consumer, as a religious consumer, what are you going to do? 
What are you going to do if you don't like the music all of a sudden or the style or the length of the service or the time of the service or the location of whatever it is? What if you are a religious consumer and those things all of a sudden stop satisfying your need? What are you going to do? You're going to pick up and you're going to go to a different show. And I'm convinced that a very important question that each of us has to answer during this COVID era is this. Why do I need the church? Why do I need it? What's the big deal? Maybe I could just stay at home and watch my favorite preachers on YouTube delivering amazing, incredible sermons. I can watch the best seminaries online. I, can, I have access to the best commentaries ever and you know what maybe I read an article or two here or a commentary or two there I'll invite some friends and we'll talk about some spiritual things and maybe that's enough maybe that's the church <laughs> maybe there is no point in joining a local church if I'm just spiritual enough at home why do you need the local church why are you here and to answer that question, we really must define what a church is. We really must figure out what the church is so then we can respond to that and say, okay, is that <clears throat> what I'm part of or not? So let's provide some definitions of a church. When we say church, we can say we're really meaning one of two things. We can either mean the universal church or the local church. And they're very closely related, but they're not the same thing. They're, they're different. So let's, let's start talking about the local church, and then we'll, we'll deal with the universal church. So the local church, I'll, I'll offer this, this uh, uh, definition for you. I don't know if it's going to be available on the screen or not. But the local church is a gathering of those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, believers, who are committed to meet regularly for worship, there it is, for teaching, for fellowship, for prayer, <coughs> and they're united by the vision of the church, and they are part of the Great Commission. They make disciples. Now, it's not a perfect definition. There's many different definitions, but that's a definition that we'll work with for today. The church can do a lot more than what's listed on the screen. And it should do a lot more. But if the church doesn't do that, then it stops being a church. That's the kind of the minimal piece of what it means to be a local church. You must be a believer and you must be regularly meeting together for a specific purpose. That purpose <coughs> is discipleship to to be discipled for or, or have teaching for worshiping the Lord together for fellowship and prayer and what brings a local church together is its vision how we do things what's our local purpose right we have this purpose from God that applies to all churches but each church expresses the way it does things a little bit differently and that's good we don't want to be just like another church down the street why because we are different people. Church is what? People. And people have different DNA. People have different gifts. People have different abilities. And so the way we're going to be able to serve one another is going to be a little bit differently than another church that has its own set of people with its own set of DNA and with its own set of gifts and abilities that God has given them. And that's great because we're able to reach different people we have diversity it's amazing you know we, we we have some diversity here a little here a little there but imagine when we are in heaven when we're in eternity we're gonna see eternal souls there from people from all kinds of different cultures from different colors of skin from different times with different different languages all of those all of those people will be united by the fact that they are believers in Christ how awesome is that <laughs> and so to be a local church to be a member of a local church you must be a believer 
You must be a child of God. You must be a born-again Christian. You must believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what is that gospel? We, we repeat it a lot, and I want you to memorize it if you can. We were created to be in eternity with God and to be in peace with God. And we broke that peace when sin has entered this world through Adam and Eve and passed on through generations. We're, we're inherently sinful people. <coughs> so that peace was broken. And now we were in rebellion with God. But He loves us. And He's shown that love through His Son, Jesus Christ. He died for you and I he, after coming down on this earth, being fully God and fully man in the flesh, and he was crucified, a very painful death, because he took the consequence of your sin and my sin. He paid the penalty for the death that you and I deserved. And now we can live a Holy Spirit-led, sanctified life that testifies to others about who he is. And so the local church believes of Jesus' people who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they believe the gospel. But you see, what makes it a local church is their commitment to regularly get together, their commitment to gather together for a specific purpose. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the teaching component there, and the fellowship, very important. We, we, that's why we create these opportunities for people to connect over a cup of coffee and the opportunity to connect over some food or, or whatever, whatever it is, or whatever activities. To the breaking of bread and prayers, that's why prayer is an important part of who we are. In fact, the, world, the, the word church is actually um, a, a translation of a Greek word that means um, called upon or, or, or called gathering of believers. It's basically a group of people who were called by God and they gather together. We also know that they worship during these gatherings. Uh, Colossians 3.16, let the word of God, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And what's interesting, the, the Bible never uses the word church when it describes a place. The Bible doesn't describe a specific building with the word church. It describes a body of believers people meeting in a geographic area. So, you know, a church in Corinth, a church in Galatia, a church in Philippi, but it's never a building or a specific place. It's always the people of that place. They probably met in multiple houses. There were probably too many believers to meet in one place. They didn't have, you know, church buildings like these. So they met in different houses. Galatians 1, verse 1 through 2. Paul an apostle, not from man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches in, of Galatia. So you see there are multiple churches, and that's important because people say, oh, it's just a universal church. It's just one big church. There is no need to belong to, little, to, to local churches. There is no need to differentiate between one church or the other. <clears throat> we see that biblically there was differentiation. We're not saying it's bad, but there were different churches that somehow were differentiated from one another. And that brings me to a second definition of a church. There is a local church, and then there is a universal church. Here is one definition of a universal church. Universal church consists of all believers everywhere in the world from the day of the Pentecost until Christ's return. So all people who were saved 
by their faith in Jesus and accepting their, their, his sacrifice, accepting his lordship, accepting the fact that he is the savior and lord of their lives and following him in all they do, those are the people who are the church and the same people that are saved now and will be saved until such time that Jesus returns. We see references in the Bible to the universal church. Not a specific church in a specific place, but a universal church. For example, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says this, But Saul, this is Apostle Paul before he was converted, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. <clears throat> Saul was not ravaging the church throughout the world or in every city or in every town. This is, this is referring to a general church, general universal church, and it's not referring to a specific church in a specific city. So this is not saying that, that Saul was, was destroying the believers in this specific town. There is a general statement. He was ravaging the church in general in different cities, in different towns. And the church that's being referred to here is a universal church. Now, interesting point. Where were these believers when they were dragged out? Where were they? In their houses. And yet the scripture refers to them as what? The church. They didn't lose their church status, church name. They didn't stop being the church. They were still the body of believers even though they were at home in that particular time. And so the ch you don't start being the church when you show up in this building. You don't start being the church when you come to a Sunday service. You are a church when you've been born again. You belong to the family of God. And when you're part of a local church, you are a, you are a member of a local church. You're part of a local church when you gather regularly, when you commit to the vision of the church. And we'll talk about that in a minute. In essence, there is the local church and universal church. There is the visible church and the invisible church. We can't see every believer that belongs to the universal church. Some believers died hundreds of years ago. They're part of the universal church. Some believers live somewhere in South America or Africa or India. I'll never meet them, but they're part of the universal church if they're part of God's family. And then there is the visible church, the local church. That's the part that can serve the community. That's the, that's the visible part that can serve one another. And here's a, an interesting or sad fact, if you will. Everybody who is part of the universal church is a born-again Christian, is a born-again believer. Every single person but not every single person that's part of a local church is a born-again believer. I wish it was so, but the reality is that's not always the case. Friends, we are part of an incredible group of followers of Jesus who are there from the past, who are there today, and those who will be there before Jesus comes back. And that's why when you meet somebody half across the world and they might speak a different language and they might have a different color skin and they might have different uh, traditions or the way they do a local service differently, they might all that have all that, but you talk to them for a couple of minutes <clears throat> and you instantly feel that bond because they are your brother in Christ and there is this connection with them because the blood of Christ united you together. You have this instant bond of fellowship. Never met a person. You open up your house to them. Why? Because they're united by the most important thing that could possibly unite you. Friends, there is a big danger 
in saying that I'm part of a universal church and I don't have to be part of a local church. Every believer who is part of the universal church should seek to apply himself through a local community of believers that meet regularly. And I know that not every church practices formal membership. And it is also true that the Bible doesn't specifically say, thou shall be a member and this is how you will do it. But we can see the principles from the scripture and we can apply them to our, our congregation and we can see that church membership is, a, is not prohibited at least. And yes, it's not specified, but we see that as a tool to be able to meet a lot of the principles that are being taught to us by the scripture. <clears throat> so... I want to just briefly mention a few things, a few reasons why church membership is important. So next time you meet somebody who says, I, I'm just a believer, but I, I don't need the local church. It's not for me. It's not a big deal. Here's why it's important. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the church membership is important because it helps the pastors of the congregation define their responsibility. What does, that, what does this verse mean? It means that as a pastor, and I'm not the only one in this church, we have a group of pastors, a group of deacons, but as a pastor, I have responsibility for you, for being able to teach you the right way, for being able to lead you the right way, to be able to take care of you the right way. It says to watch over your souls, encourage when necessary, <clears throat> admonish when necessary, and Believe it or not, I will have to answer to God for how well I was doing that. Now, as a pastor, I'm not responsible for Christians all over the world. I'm not responsible for people who are living in Africa or South America. That's not where God called me. But I am responsible to shepherd those people who God has entrusted under our care in this particular congregation. And so membership is a way for us to define who is under our care and who is our responsibility for which we will have to account for to God. And frankly, when you become a member of a local congregation, whether this one or another one, you are basically saying that I'm willingly, I'm voluntarily willing to submit under the authority of the shepherds who are leading that congregation. That's how it works. It's important because it helps define the areas of responsibilities for the local church. The other reason why church membership is important is because without a clearly defined responsibility or membership, you cannot have accountability or church discipline applied. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is talking a lot about sin. He's talking about this rampant sin that's really just kind of, kind of running all over this church in and, and Corinth, and, and, it, and it's really bad. And then he says something interesting in verse 12 and 13. If you take a look at chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, he's actually to referring to the insiders and outsiders. You see, there, is, there has got to be a definition of who is inside the congregation of Good News Church and who is outside of that. I, as a pastor, cannot apply church discipline to somebody <clears throat> who is outside of the congregation because they're not under my authority. And we do that as an elders group, by the way. It's not just me. This inside and outside reference, it refers to the local church. And the membership helps define those boundaries. Another reason church membership is important is because it, it is a sign that you are committing 
to the local vision and mission of the local church and, and, and its purpose and the way we're doing things. It, it pro provides this, this sign that says, hey, we are one. We are, we're united in sharing this with you. Now, now, it doesn't mean that you agree on every single thing. It doesn't mean that we must all be the same. It, mu it does not mean that there is not a place for diversity in the body of Christ. But it means that on key things, we have unity of mind and we're saying, I want to be part Part of how God is working through this church it's like saying in in Philippians 2 2 it's basically saying that we're of the same mind that we have the same love that we have the full accord of one mind that's part of why a church membership exists so don't fall for the danger of saying, I belong to the universal church, local church, therefore is irrelevant, I got discovered. There are many descriptions, now that we've provided some definitions. I wanna paint a picture, it's kind of incredible how Jesus taught, he, he taught in parables, he, he painted a picture to people that, that they really could understand, they, they really just, just could see, and it was, it was, it was amazing. It was, he, he related to them through their everyday life. And so I don't want to reinvent the, the wheel here. I want to just share some of the pictures that the Bible uh, paints the church as. So what does the Bible say the church is so that we can make a decision whether it's relevant uh, for our, daily way, our everyday life or not? So here's the thing. There are many biblical metaphors that help us understand what church is. And the first I want to mention is this. Church is the body. Church is the body, and Christ is the head of that body. And this is one of the most familiar descriptions of the church. This is the one that kind of everybody knows and everybody's aware of. There's a lot of examples of how the church consists of different organs and different members are all working together for the greater good. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says this, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. There is this unity. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We are one body. We're unique. There is not a single one of you that's exactly the same way as somebody else in this congregation or in the world for that matter. Unless even twins, there are some, some ways you can tell them apart, right? As close as you can get. You're unique with your unique abilities and gifts, but we're all one brought together into one body of Christ. Now, he doesn't mention here that Christ is the head of that body, meaning Christ is the one that directs that body and that we live for Christ. We live for his purposes. And he, the reason he does that is because he's emphasizing the unity of the body. Many members, each one has different function, but all are as body of Christ. And every member, every single one of you, if you're a believer, you have a spiritual gift. And you should use that gift within that body so that that body can function correctly. You know, many times, just a quick aside, I hear, well, something is not working well in church, something is, this is not working or that is not working. I have a conviction that when there is a need in a local congregation, it's because somebody in that congregation is not using their gift. I believe, and I'm convinced of that, that God has given this church and every church out there every single thing that church needs in order to live out the God-given function and God-given calling. And if there is a problem with the way that function works, it's because the members of that body, there is an organ in that body that's not functioning correctly, whether it's the pastor or whether it's the leadership or whether it's the people not being equipped, whatever it is. We have everything we need to live the kind of life that God called us to. And if there is a shortage of that, it's because a member, an organ, is not living out their purpose. In Ephesians 1, 22, 23, he says this, Paul says this, and he put all things under his feet. He's talking about Jesus here. Gave him as head 
over all things to the church, church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is saying that Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the one who is the head of that body. Christ is who this church is living for. And so again, the church is the body, Christ is the head. The other metaphor, the other picture that the Bible paints of the church is that the church is the bride of Christ. Bride of Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 5, he talks a lot about the relationship between husbands and wives. It's a chapter that you kind of go to to talk about, you know, who is doing what. And then he says this in chapter 5, verse 32. He says this, this mystery, he's talking about the marriage, is profound. He's saying marriage is a mystery, and, and yeah, I can relate to that, being married for, for oh boy, yeah, 20 years. <laughs> It'll be 21, 21. It was a test, I'm 21 in March, right? So, uh, yes, 21. <laughs> So I'm, I'm getting nervous here. My wife is looking at me. I'm going to be in trouble right after this because I may not have counted correctly, but I'm pretty sure it's 21. So it's a mystery. And what Paul is saying, hey, it's a mystery. It's profound. It's a deep mystery. And by the way, this also relates to Jesus and the church. It refers to Christ and the church. The, the church is the bride of Christ. It is the, the wife of the lamb that was sacrificed for that church. And with the same kind of love that you might see in the bride's eyes looking at the, at the groom. I get, I get to do weddings and you have the, the bride and the groom and they're looking at each other with love. They're willing to die for each other. They want to be together for eternity. Yes, there are problems, but they, they, they want that kind of love to continue forever. What he's saying here is that that's the kind of love that you must have for Jesus that's the kind of love that church should have for Christ we're to relate to Christ in love just like a bride relates to their groom in love we must have joy in the knowledge that he loves us that Jesus loves his church just like a groom loves his bride now I don't know it's kind of weird for for me at least to think of myself as the bride. I don't know, I'm a guy, right? So you typically think yourself, I'm the groom, but it's a little, we had some conversations on the subject a while back, but it's, it, it, it feels awkward, but don't focus on that. Focus on the love and the relationship between the bride and the groom, and that's the relationship between Jesus and his church. Another way that the Bible describes church is that it's the family church is a family or the household of God that's one of the reasons we we talk a lot about good news church family because I want all of us to change our thinking and think of us as a family and that's extremely important why let's take a look in Ephesians 2 19 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God this is uh, another picture of remember when, when God describes us as brothers and sisters in the Lord when we're described in the Bible as brothers and sisters it supports this picture of a family we are God's children through new birth by being born again we've been adopted into his family and that's the truth that should change our way of thinking that's why we constantly talk about good news church family we are a family because if we're not a family then all we are is a Sunday program a Sunday show that you attend you sit through you get some benefits out of it you donate a little bit like you would at LA Fitness to pay for your membership and then you leave that's not what a church is a church is a family because families gather together for a very different reason than people who came to watch a movie. Families get together for relationships. 
relationships that have been formed out of the bond of Jesus Christ dying for us. And that's the bond we have. Family members don't threaten to leave. Imagine me telling my kids, you know what, child, you haven't been cleaning your room well enough. I'm going to swap you for another kid. Anybody wants to do that? Let's be honest, sometimes, right? Once in a while. Or you have an argument with your wife, and yes, I confess, as a pastor, it doesn't happen very often. I don't remember um, when it actually happened last time, but it, it, I sometimes argue with my wife. And you're like, you know what? Nah, next. We don't do that. That's absurd. But why is it that we treat the church the same way? As soon as we come and as soon as something in that church program, in the movie theater with a spiritual focus that we came to consume as religious consumers, as soon as something doesn't work out the way we want it to, all of a sudden it becomes a problem when we go church hopping. I want to tell you, every time um, I'm, I'm speaking on some of these issues, people say, you know, is there a problem? Are you addressing an issue that we're having? I just want you to know I'm preaching from the text. I'm not using a specific example. Uh, I'm not thinking with specific family. This is, this is what the text says. This is what the Bible teaches. Friends, the family bond keeps the family together when they work out their differences in love. In love. At least that's what should happen in the family of God. Another picture, another metaphor. The church is a temple of God. The church is a temple of God. When Paul talks about the church in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, here's what he says. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple <clears throat> in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. What this is saying is that when you become a believer, you, the Holy Spirit lives within you. He lives within your heart. And yes, individually we are basically a, a, a temple, a, a house, a dwelling of God, but collectively as a body of believer, we live out who God is in us. And, and you see, that's why we must be sanctified. That's why we must try to be holy in our behavior. Because we have a holy God within us as a body of believers. The church is also the flock of God. The flock. Paul writes to the elders, to the pastors at the church in Ephesus and Acts 20 verse 28 he says pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood friends the church doesn't belong to me it doesn't belong to any other pastor it doesn't belong to any other elder whether it's this church or another church it's not my church. It's God's church. And we've been, we've been uh, entrusted, all of you, as part of a flock that we are to shepherd collectively with other elders so that we're able to teach the truth. We can facilitate fellowship. We can give you opportunities for worship. We can pray together, encourage one another, admonish sometimes when necessary, apply church discipline. But that's God's church. And that's why pastors change. Someday, I, I, it's not going to be me. There's going to be hopefully a, another person from the next generation taking over. And it will continue being a God's church. The church is also the pillar and support of the truth. In 1 Timothy 3.15, it says, If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. It, the buttress means support. It's the something that holds everything else up. 
in this crazy world where everything is relative, what's true for you is not true for me. You know, today I might feel this way, I can change my gender, I can change my sexual orientation, I can do all these things because, you know, what's true for you is not true for me and I can make the decisions on my own. It's all relative in today's world. Friends, I want to tell you that there is an absolute truth, and that truth comes from God, and He's revealed Himself to us in the Scripture. The truth never changes. Whether it's hundreds of years old, it does not change. The methods change. How we do worship styles change. How we dress change changes. How we build buildings and how we do our programs, how we do activities. All of those things change so that we can better fulfill our mission, the Great Commission. But the truth of the gospel, the truth of the scripture never changes. It's not relative. It's absolute. And today when we live in a world where everything is relative and everything can be changed, it is the responsibility of the church to be the support, the pillar of that truth. Friends, in conclusion, I want to I say this. The church is not a place where you show up two, three times a month and get some spiritual food if you have nothing better to do. That's not a church. We're not here to entertain you. We're not here to be the best show in Tacoma. We're not here to even fulfill all your needs. But if you're a member of God's family, we're here to relate to one another through a bond that's just absolutely incredible. The bond of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for all of us. So that we can live out our lives together. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Shared and hey, this is the vision of the local church. We want to move forward in this particular way. We want to serve the community. We want to serve the next generation. We want to equip these people so that they go and, and make disciples. If you're a member, if you are a, a member of the universal church and a local church if you've trusted your life to Christ and you are joined with other members you're one body with him as the head the idea of a Christian saying I am a Christian but I belong to no local church is not an idea that is supported by the New Testament Ephesians 4.16 says this, For whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, when each member of the church is living out their purpose, the body will grow and it will build itself up in love. My sincere desire for you, church, for us all together as a local congregation, the Good News Church family, is to be the kind of body that grows and builds itself up in love. And that will only happen if each member works properly and lives out their purpose. My desire is that we live that out. God works every part to work properly and to grow to be built up in love. May we be the kind of church that lives this out and testifies to others of how incredible and amazing and loving our God is. Amen.